I will. Uh, I will begin. I will begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for these students and we pray you to be with us. Help us to glorify you what we do and just to learn, learn a little bit more about your creation today, uh, about circles and ellipses, hyperbolas, these things. Lord, in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. So, let me begin. Um, so, we've talked about lines. We've talked about, um, you know, Parabolas, I suppose, right? But there is more. So let me just start with a few examples here. So example one, we might be up against something like x squared plus y squared um, over, uh, over 4 equals to 1. So if I'm talking, you should not be talking. I need the talking to stop in here. Thank you. Example two, we're going to look at x squared minus y squared equals to one. And then example three, we're going to look at um, x minus three squared plus y um, plus four squared equals to, oh, let's say nine. So we have not graphed anything like this yet, right? But I can teach you how to graph these pretty easily. They're not that hard. Um, and just to let you know what we're where we're going, if you have a pattern, <coughs> an equation that looks kind of like this, it's going to be an ellipse. All right, this is going to be an ellipse. If you have something that's like a difference of squares, it's going to be a hyperbola. And if you have something like this, where the squared terms both have the same number in front, like see the difference between that? This one has like a fourth times the y squared. So this one actually will end up being a circle, all right? So that's what we have to look forward to. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna explain to you how to graph it um, in terms of just looking at where it intersects the x, y coordinate axes. That's a simple, um, reliable approach to graph these kind of things. So let's start with x equals to zero. If we put x equals to zero, what do we get for our equation? We get zero squared plus y squared over four equals to one, right? So can we solve that? Well, that's, that's y squared equals to four. Okay, so y is equal to? Two, square root property, right? Plus or minus the square root of four, also known as? plus or minus two. So when x is equal to zero, y is equal to plus or minus two. So I'll do, I'll do a couple black dots for those. Here's one up here and one down here. So there is zero minus two and of course up here is zero two. Now on the flip side of things, we can look at y equals to zero. So y equals to zero, plug y equals to zero into the equation. What, what does that give us? Well, it gives us x squared plus zero squared over four, also known as zero, equals to one. So lo and behold, we get x squared equals to one. What are the solutions to x squared equals to one? Well, we know how to solve that. Square root property, right? X is equal to? Uh, plus or minus one. Yeah, plus or minus one. So from what's in red, I see two more points on the graph, all right? Two more points on the graph <coughs> are here and there. Namely, x equals to one, y equals to zero, or x equals to minus one, y equals to zero. And since I know the general pattern is an ellipse, I know it looks like a squished egg, I can pretty much connect the dots from here. A <laughs> what? A kite. a kite. Oh, yeah. That's the kind of thing a math major would say. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Or a friend of a math major. I think you should talk to them. They want to be math majors too? Yeah. Yes. You get extra credit if you become a math major. I need to see the paperwork though. Like it's not, I can't, we can't just be a math major in our heart. It needs to be on paper. It needs to be the primary major too. I'll switch my major. Really? Huh. 
Hmm. Wouldn't it be funny if I did that with like 20 students and all of a sudden like the math major doubled in size and then the dean is like, what's, what's happened? Why has the math major grown so much? And be like, <laughs> All right, so um, silliness aside, there's an ellipse. Now, my brother says that this radius, this, the, the ellipse has radius one and it has radius two. I kind of like that. I don't think your book has that. But like an ellipse is like a, it's like a circle with two different radii, right? It's got a big radius and a small radius, right? But that's how to graph an ellipse, if you could just figure out where its turning points are and then you can just kind of connect the dots, right? Yeah. Can you always plug zero in for x and y? Um, no. Um, if the ellipse was, like let me point out. So to answer your question, if my ellipse, um, if my ellipse looked like this, If my ellipse looked like that, when I looked for x equal to zero and y equals to zero, then there'd be no intersection points. So x equal to zero, y equal to zero, interesting when the ellipse is centered at the origin. But in principle, we could look at ellipses which were centered other places. If we have time today, I'll show you one, okay? Um, example two is hyperbola. And so here, <coughs> nah, my bad. Um, x equal to zero, we can look at that. What happens? We get zero squared minus y squared equals to one. We get y squared equals to minus one. We get nothing, right? I mean, we're looking for real solutions, right? How do you plot the imaginary numbers on the graph? You don't, unless you've got some YouTube channel and you're trying to like sell people on imaginary numbers, whatever. We're not doing that. So. This means there's no real solution, which means there's no point on the graph. This means, this means that x squared minus y squared equals to 1 does not intersect the x equals to 0 curve, which is the what? It's the what? I, heard, I think I heard it. Somebody say it? It's the what axis? It's the x equals to zero is here, right? It's the y-axis. So whatever this thing is, it doesn't cross the y-axis. All right, so let's look at y equals to zero. See what happens there, y equals to zero. Well there, we have x squared minus zero squared equals to one. x squared equals to one. We know how to solve this, x is equal to? Plus or minus one which means I get this point here and this point there, namely, um, <coughs> goodness gracious, minus one zero over here, one zero. Now that's not the whole story yet. To graph, to graph a hyperbola, what you need is these two points, the so-called vertices of the hyperbola, the turning points of the hyperbola. But the other thing you need is its asymptotes. Now how do you figure out the asymptotes of a hyperbola? There's a simple procedure, what you do, is you take the equation, all right, here is the equation, and you get rid of, if there's a constant over here, just get rid of it, just get rid of it. And you solve x squared minus y squared equals to zero. That gives me y squared equals to x squared, which solves to give me y is plus or minus x. So y equals plus or minus x are the asymptotes of this hyperbola. The reason that the, what I wrote in green is like reasonable is we're talking about what happens when x and y are huge, right? So if x and y are huge, one is nothing in comparison. So it's just completely about the x and the y. So we basically can just drop the one and it's, if, if it's as if it's zero. And these are the asymptotes. So the asymptotes, do you guys remember vertical asymptotes from this course? I sure hope not because I didn't cover it yet, right? But you may be in high school, you covered vertical asymptotes. Remember those things that the graph comes close to, but it doesn't cross. Remember those? Yeah. Yeah, those things. These are like that, but these are slant asymptotes. These are asymptotes of a hyperbola. And so the graph, it, it, it approaches those, but it doesn't get past them. So look, it's like this, basically. 
to the limits of my artistry. Something like that. So there you go, there's your... And just to give this thing a name, this is a um, sideways opening hyperbola. Or if you want to sound more intelligent, you can say it's a horizontally opening hyperbola. All right? <clears throat> Do you see why we call it horizontally opening? Because it opens to the side. This same example, if instead of having x squared minus y squared, if we instead had y squared minus x squared, it would be the same shape, but turned with x and y reversed, right? So if you, if you just um, change this to y squared minus x squared equals to 1, it's a vertically open, opening hyperbola. Do you see what I'm saying? Like if I just change y squared minus x squared equal to 1, <coughs> the same shape, but opening that way. <coughs> Excuse me. If you want, I can make this picture. Let me, let me clutter this picture. Check it out. You'd have this. It goes down like that. You have this. It goes up like that. Essentially the same analysis. This blue graph right here would be y squared minus x squared equals to 1. Its turning points are like um, 0, 1 and 0, minus 1. See? <coughs> hmm. <sighs> Tired of this cough. Okay. Any, any questions so far? Do you guys feel like you could graph these if you had some time? And, or how about this? If I gave you equations and I'm like, here's three equations, here's three graphs, match. Could you play a match game? Which one's the hyperbola? Which one's the ellipse? Yeah. That's a pretty good way to ask about this because it gives me no joy to watch students try to graph these things. Um, <clears throat> so it makes the test so much easier if I give you. It's on mission, though. Well, I know. I do, I do want you to learn. But <clears throat> The laziness of my grading should always be remembered. Okay, so um, what's this? So let, let me take you a walk down memory lane. Do you remember this? Distance formula. The distance from, say, x1, y1 to x2, y2, what's the formula for that? We take the square root of parentheses x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. This is the distance formula. Distance from the point x1, y1 to x2, y2. The distance formula, right? Do you guys remember that? If not, well, you can learn it now, right? There it is. If you want to calculate the distance between points, do that. So, this equation I wrote in example three, what does it mean? Let's put down a sentence that explains what this means. <coughs> this equation says that the distance from three minus four to x comma y is what? It's not the, but this isn't the distance, is it? What is it? It's missing the square root, isn't it? So if you, if you look at it, that's actually the distance squared, right? It's the distance squared. Do you see that? It's the distance squared from this to that is 9. <coughs> so what does that mean? The distance is, so, the, so that implies distance is what? is just 3, right? So that, that equation says there's distance 3 between the point x, y on the curve and uh, this, this fixed point uh, 3 minus 4. What is that? Well, I guess I told you at the start of all this, so I kind of ruined it. I guess I should have given you a spoiler alert. Oh well, it's too late. x, y, the center of the circle is 3 minus 4. 
So boop, 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 boop. So about here. Because the distance squared is nine. Oh. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, so we take the collection of all points, which are distance three from the center point. So like, there's one here, and I guess it touches the y-axis over here, right? Down there, there's one over here. Something like that. And the radius is what? Three. So what we're looking at is a circle of radius 3 centered at 3 comma minus 4. That's what this, this curve is. Does that make sense? Now I, I decided to make the, the circle not be centered at the origin because circles are like more friendly, right? But you understand we could just as well have taken the ellipse or the hyperbola and also centered it somewhere else. Like we could move these shapes other places just the same. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's do another example. They don't always come up. They don't always come to you so nice and pretty. And you might wonder, um, like, you might you might criticize. You might be like, uh, Dr. Cook, like, what's your problem? Like, there's a book. There's sections in the book. They're in a particular order. Why must you be this way? We're in chapter 6, right? This is actually section 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. Why, why do I put this material here in the course? Why not later? That is exactly why. I think, it, I, exactly, I think it's easier to learn now. I think it actually goes really nicely with what we're doing, and I hope I can convince you of that in the next two examples because we're actually going to be <clears throat> using some of the ideas we already have in a new way. So let's do it. So example, <coughs> ay, ay, ay. Ex example four, if I can talk. Suppose you're up against x squared. Um, minus 20x plus um, 2y squared um, plus 8y equals to 0. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to figure out what on earth this curve is. You say it's a circle, why? Because it's in the formula of that circle. It looks like the circle equation. Now, well, let's see what happens. So, first of all, x squared minus 20x, what can we do? Factor out an x. Factor out an x. You could do that, but that would not be helpful. Okay. I mean, she's not wrong. You could factor an x out. But instead, what we're going to do is complete the square. x minus 10 squared minus 100. All right? Now, how about the y's? I'm going to make an opening move on the y. I'm not going to complete the square yet, but that's 2 times what? 2 times parentheses y squared plus 4y, right? You guys with me? I like to factor the 2 out before I try to complete the square here. Now that I've factored the 2 out, I can complete the square on y. What's it look like? First of all, I still got my x minus 10 squared minus 100 over here. But then I also have plus 2 times, complete the square on this, what do I get? I get y plus what? I take half of 4, which is 2, and I have to subtract 2 squared, which is 4, like that. Now keep in mind, <coughs> I have to distribute that back out, right? So here we go. We have x minus 10 squared plus twice y plus 2 squared. There's a square there. Um, and that's equal to 100. And then see this, this is 2. 2 times 4. As there's a minus 8. Move it to the other side, so plus 8. 
All right. Um, so that's 108. This, this, uh, the two times four. This right here. That that led to this eight. All right. So the. Um, I guess I should tell you guys. Seem like nice enough people. That the general equation of ellipse looks like this: x minus h squared over um, over a a squared plus y minus um, y minus k squared over b squared equals to one. So this puts the ellipse with radii a and b and center hk. Now I'm not sure your book uses the terminology radii, but I've I've grown I've grown to like it. I, I saw my brother write it in something I was looking at yesterday and I was like, you know, that's a good thing to call them. We should just call them it's got two radii. It's got two radiuses. Okay, so this isn't quite the right pattern yet to really understand what this ellipse is. All I gotta do is divide by 108 to put it in like the nice format. So this is like x minus 10 squared divided by 108 um, plus y plus 2 squared. And then I got a 2 upstairs. I'm dividing by 108, which puts a 54 downstairs if you do the arithmetic here. So now I can tell you what this is. This is an ellipse which is centered at 10 minus 2 with radii square root of 108 and square root of 54. So I can graph it if I wanted to. If I was so foolish as to attempt such a thing. 10 minus 2, maybe it's like here-ish. Now, the square root of 108 is what? It's approximately 10.5-ish. What's the square root of 54? about 7.5-ish. So what that means is you're going to go plus or minus 10 in the x sense. So roughly speaking, it's going like here-ish to here-ish in the x. And in the y, it's, it's not quite as much. It's like here and here, roughly speaking. And so it would look something like this. Now, I don't usually ask you guys to graph the ellipse in this kind of problem. I usually just ask you to identify what kind of curve it is. So like your solution might stop at when you get to like here, you'd be like, this is an ellipse centered at 10 minus 2 with radii, you know, square root of 108 and square root of 54. Although I would give probably significant partial credit if you just completed the square correctly and came to this equation right here, which shows that it's an ellipse, right? This dividing by 108 to make it pretty to understand the graph, that's just a little bit extra. I didn't do that in the other section because I got <coughs> taken in other directions. Yep. Where did you get 54 again? So, <coughs> good question. There's a 2 here, and then we divided by 108. So that's equal to, you know, 1 over 108 over 2, right? Which is 1 over 54. I hope. Yeah. Are we good? Yep. Oh, just because the pattern, the, the standard form for the ellipse is up here. Like this is the standard form of the ellipse. And to put it into the standard form of the ellipse equation, I have to put a 1 on the other side, and so I have to make this 1 over here, so that's why I divide by 108 to make it match that pattern. <coughs> Excuse me. Because once I do that, I know that from the center it goes like plus or minus a in the x direction, and plus or minus b in the y direction from the center of the ellipse. I can graph it from those. If I'm just looking at like this equation, I don't know quite what's happening without like plugging numbers in and seeing what happens, like we did in the other first three examples. <coughs>
Okay, so what, what's the thing we did first week? Do you guys remember? We yeah, we solved one equation, one unknown. That's right. And then we oh yeah, we graphed lines, right? Remember that? Parallel lines, perpendicular lines, distance from line to a point. Remember that? Did we ever understand that? Might it come back on the test? I see a no. <laughs> it's optimism. <clears throat> it might. It might come back. I would make sure I understood how to do that problem. Um, <clears throat> now. But then we also solve two equations and two unknowns, right? Do you remember? So graphically, we could think about those as what? <coughs> we could think about them in terms of lines, right? So two linear equations and two unknowns. Either the lines are parallel. There's no solution at all, right? They're the same, same line, so there's infinitely many solutions. Or the lines have different slopes, right? So they intersect at one point and only one point, so there's one unique solution, right? What would happen now if we solve two nonlinear equations and two unknowns? What, what can happen then? So let's look at that. Example five. I'll keep it pretty simple. What if we had x squared minus y squared equals to one, and we have x squared plus y squared equals to, let's say, 4. Can we solve these two equations at once? And actually, before we even solve it, can we make a graph to understand what's going to happen? Can we anticipate how the algebra is going to lead us? What do you guys think? Let me make a really quick graph. So. Listen, we graphed the first equation already. That was the sideways opening hyperbola, right? You're like, you just erased it. I don't know, but that's fine. It was this. That was the, that's this equation right here. This is x squared minus y squared equals to 1. It's that sideways opening hyperbola. When x equals to 0, you got no solution. x squared plus y squared equals to 4. That is a circle. Where's the center of the circle? Yeah, at the center, at the origin, right? So, and its radius is 2. So, that is something like that, roughly speaking. So, this is x squared plus y squared equals to 2 squared. Radius is 2. How many solutions should we expect to find? How, four, right? Because there's four points where the curves intersect. Places where the curve intersect are places where both equations hold true. If there are no such places, there are no solutions. But we expect this system should have not one, not two, not three, four solutions. Now, so if we work this out, how should we solve these? Can we use the ideas we already had earlier to solve these? How about, how about adding and subtracting equations? Is that going to be a good move? I, I think adding equations is going to be super nice here, right? What happens when I add equations? The, the y's go away, right? And I get 2x squared equals to 5. Ah, which then gives us x squared is equal to 5 over 2. We can solve this, right? It's like taking candy from a baby, right? The baby is sleeping, to be clear. It's like that kind of baby. Not an awake baby holding a candy. That's a different story altogether, right? <clears throat> if you know your babies. Let's see here. So that's x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. Aha! Now what? We need to find y. So what's the y? So take this and plug it back into whichever equation you like. Which, which, which equations do you guys want to use? One or two? The one one? Okay. So we've got plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. We take that, we square it, right? Minus y squared is equal to 1. Now, if I was smarter, what could I have done? I could have remembered where I came from, right? What got us to the solution was x squared equals to 5 halves, right? So what should happen when I plug that into the first equation? x squared should just become 
five halves. So I could l logically just have started with five halves minus y squared equals to one, right? But I was plugging it in. And so then <coughs> that gives me y squared is equal to five halves minus one, also known as three halves. So what's y equal to? Plus or minus the square root of what? Uh, well, three over two. Using the square root property to solve y squared equals to three halves. Now, notice that the plus and the minus here, they're not logically connected. Like they're, they could either be both pluses, both minuses, one plus, one minus, one minus, one plus. They're all allowed solutions here. That's why we get four points. And the four points that we get explicitly are, well, like this one here would be x was what? Square root of 5 over 2? And the y is, in fact, minus the square root of 3 over 2. This point over here would be minus the square root of 5 over 2 minus the square root of 3 over 2. This point up here minus the square root of 5 over 2 plus the square root of 3 over 2. And finally, this guy up here would be, you know, square root of 5 over 2, comma, plus the square root of 3 over 2. And there, there you go. I can figure out there's four points with the quick graph pretty easily, right? But if you asked me what the coordinates were with, for those points, I would have been like, I, I, don't, I don't know. But with about three or four minutes of algebra, I can easily deduce that the points of intersection are those four points I just wrote in black. So you could solve two equations and two unknowns, two linear equations and two unknowns before, right? Now that we know about hyperbolas and ellipses and circles, we can meaningfully solve two nonlinear equations and two unknowns by the same ideas. And what's interesting is that the solution sets there's so much more that can happen. You can have no solutions, you can have two solutions, you can have four solutions, all kinds of things. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I thought you were allowed to have a fraction under radicals. Oh, we can have fractions under radicals, but what we can't do if we want real solutions is have negative. We can't have like a negative. Fractions under radicals are allowed. I thought you always had to square root of three squared. <coughs> oh, oh, oh. So you're you're, you're, so this is kind of like the, like, you know how if you're at some, if you're at a sufficiently uh, fancy family, you have to use a certain fork for a certain plate? What you're talking about is kind of like that in mathematics. They, they teach you these kind of good manners in like high school, and the good manners in high school says, thou shalt not write such an expression. Thou shalt write this, and upon writing this, thou shalt multiply by the third over the third. Like so. And, and having done such, thou shalt write the square root of 6 over 2, as that is an infinitely more correct uh, rationalized fraction. And if we were in, like, in your high school class, yes, what's on the right-hand side would have been correct, and what's on the left-hand side would have been incorrect. But in my class, we use whichever fork we want. So you can use this one, or you can use that one. Like, it's all good. <coughs> yeah. You guys know about the fancy forks? No. What? what? About future math classes. Future math classes. If, if anybody in a future math class insisted on you doing this, I want to know who it is so that I can go harangue them. It's like, no, that's not cool. I mean, it's, it is good that you know that because that's an important algebraic skill, but <coughs> we don't have to do it unless... Um, it is true. It is true, guys. This is an issue if you want to like look at the answer key to a book. Like sometimes the answer key to a book might do this kind of thing for the answer. So recognizing that this is equal to that could be helpful in as much as you're comparing your answers to a book or something. I will say that much. That is true. And that's also why your high school teacher insisted on you doing it so that they could lazily look at their answer key and say, oh, they have the answer in the answer key. As opposed to thinking, I mean, I don't know your high school teacher. Maybe they thought. Other questions? Questions about the mission? Anybody got any questions about the mission? It's due Friday, right? It is due Friday. 
actually go over the whole mission? Can we, I will go over the whole mission Friday. When's our test? Monday. Monday. I sent an announcement out about ODAS accommodations. If you are a person with ODAS accommodations, please read my announcement and contact me directly. Do not just go to ODAS and complain about whatever you think I'm doing or not doing. Just contact me directly, please. I can, I like, I try to give tests to everybody in the classroom because then if I have a hint or something, you're there for it. If you go to the testing center and take tests, you don't get the hint, right? And in terms of extra time, if you have extra time, you take it in the classroom, I can just give you time after class to finish it, all right? You come back to my office, it's cool. Um, now, if you really, really want to take it in the testing center for reasons I don't fully understand, that's fine. Go do it, great. But you need to warn me ahead of time so that I actually send your test over there. Because by default, I try to get students to take them in the class with everybody else. <coughs> um, so, and also, sometimes wires get crossed. Like I tell the testing center, you know, you're allowed a page of notes. And then sometimes, you know, they, well, they have this habit of collecting your note page, which I don't want them to collect the note page, right? Um, you, you, get a, you get a page of notes for the test, right? You make that page of notes. You bring it. You get to use it. After the test, you don't turn in the page of notes. I, like I said, you can put a picture of your beloved, uh, a list of your future dog names, like whatever. Cat names if you're an evil person. Um, <clears throat> I don't. It's so hostile. It's so hostile. Yes. Sorry. I have a cat named Oreo. <laughs> a cat named Oreo. Yeah, he's a tuxedo cat, and he has a sister named. What section are we in? He's a tuxedo cat. Yeah, like some sort of evil mastermind cat or something. I call him Mr. All right. Yep. How many questions are going to be on the what? How many are going to be on the test? Oh, enough. Enough. Um, yeah. It occurs to me, my estimation of how much time we had left is incorrect, but we do have a quiz for today. So... I probably should get you started on this. Um, because I have um, robbed you of much, too much time with my blathering about nonsense, you may skip two on this quiz. Just do two problems. Pick two. Pick, pick two. Um, if you've got extras, pass them over because I have, I've done poorly. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I apparently can't count over there. I <clears throat> All right, so here's the deal. Friday, I will allot half of class to talk about any remaining questions you guys have about the missions. I'm collecting the mission halfway through class Friday. So like, you know, 25 minutes in, I collect the mission, all right? The remainder of class, we will talk about solutions to the mission. So I can't very well not have it collected. So you have to turn it in halfway through class, all right? Now, if you don't have it stapled, I don't care that much. I will staple it. Just make sure your name is on every page so I can figure out, you know. <coughs> I got my hand in the textbook. <laughs> Does that make sense? So there's still some time, if you have like one or two problems left on the mission, we can talk about whatever that is. But if 25 people have 25 different problems, that won't work. Do try to finish most of it, obviously. 